Let, uh, oh, this is. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm not going to. I, I really wanted to say a lot of things tonight, but I'm not going to since we're starting a little late. I just want to express my heartfelt appreciation that all of you are here. Uh, these are very critical times for us. Uh, we're giving up the third production space on the other side, the larger room, which would have been great for this, simply because the overhead is so extreme. And we just have to cut back. And financially, we're just, you know, like holding on by our fingernails. And uh, the plan is to also uh, close the store and concentrate solely in the front of this space on some of the uh, shamanic items, which are the primary things that we've become known as a uh, resource for. And it's something that I probably can handle uh, very easily without being drawn away. The other big thing is the in the proposed project that's coming up that was, uh, I think I should turn that down. I've got competition with myself. Let's see if I can, there we go. This is fun. There we go. All right. Uh, I had, out of our own need of being really unable to continue our newsletter because it was costing more than it was bringing in, so again, a financial crunch, which seems to be the, the nature of reality, uh, we were left without any outreach to all of you. And I realized that what was lacking in the Bay Area was a monthly calendar of events that was really comprehensive of all the good things that are happening. So I did a proposal to Lawrence Rockefeller and got a grant for several thousand dollars to do a feasibility study, and it seems more than feasible. And we're actively uh, seeking financing now and doing business plan as formally as possible and uh, developing staff and uh, structure for the whole thing as well. So that is taking a lot of my energy. And we're also doing some refocusing as to the events that we do here. And one of the things that we found very satisfying was what I call dialogues, actually trialogues. And I, th I think I've come up with omnilogue. <laughs> because uh, what we'll be doing is bringing together notables from diverse fields into an interaction and invite all of you to participate in that, and literally creating a, a circle, a council, and taking a topic and having each of those authorities in their own fields come together and interact. And I've discovered that those people have also been very eager to hear what the others are doing. They, they miss each other in their transits across the country and around the world. And an opportunity for a day to sit down, deal with an issue profoundly uh, has been highly desirable for them as well as, I hope, all of you. We've done it a couple of times, and it's been stunning. And uh, that would be the sort of thing that we'd also include in the editorial aspects of what we call the monthly mentor, which is uh, trying to keep it less new age, a little more straight and academic. And because what we want to do is really reach out to all of those that are emerging out of the uh, high rises at this point into a familiarity with what we've called new age for a long time. All of the things that I see as life enhancing and spirit enhancing. So uh, I'll keep it that brief, which wasn't very brief. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to introduce Colin Wilson, one of the more extraordinary beings for a long time. I, I like to think that the angry young man has turned into a, a mellow <laughs> older man at this point. And the outsider has been rummaging around inside <laughs> and has come to some amazing conclusions. And from all of the tales I've heard in this recent journey to the United States, uh, obviously he's been stirring hearts and minds around the Bay Area and elsewhere. And I just want to express my appreciation to him and to you for being here to participate in this. So thank you, and uh, I'll wire Colin up, and uh, we'll be off and running. I just want to mention, and I don't know whether you've even seen a poster or not, but I, I labeled this the integrity of intention. Now, <laughs> <laughs> see, see what you can do with that. <laughs>
<laughs> well, <clears throat> yes. Well, I don't know. I've been rambling around America for the past three weeks, talking all over the place. And, you know, I find this is very good for me. I, um, I clarify my own ideas as I do it. And, you know, I clarified them to the point where I realized they're so disgustingly simple that I hardly, <laughs> dare, to, <laughs> hardly dare to come and speak about them. <laughs> this, this is true, basically. Particularly, you know, on a lecture trip like this, where you're moving from place to place, you get a bit bewildered and you can't remember, you know, who you were talking to yesterday or who said something to you. And in the 1960s, when this first happened to me, my first uh, lecture tour in America was arranged by Brinin, who um, arranged Dylan Thomas's lecture tours. And I could see why they killed Dylan Thomas. <laughs> because um, of this absurd business of rushing from place to place. Uh, <clears throat> the average kind of thing was that you got to somewhere at about 11 o'clock in the morning, your plane landed, and you, you were met by a deputation of students and a faculty member who said that they'd arranged three seminars for you in the afternoon. <laughs> and then, you know, you had a faculty party, and followed by dinner, followed by your lecture, and then a few students wanted to take you downtown to a special bar that they knew. And by the time you got through the faculty party, when you know, 30 faculty wives asked, where have you been so far? Where are you going to next? How do you like America? And you'd answered them all 30 times. And uh, then on to the dinner, which left you first so bloated and so tired and slightly drunk that you um, didn't express yourself very well. But nevertheless, you know, you rise to the occasion and do your best. And then the students take you off downtown and you say, look, I must be in bed by midnight. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, you stagger into bed. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, you're wakened up by the sort of chauffeur who takes you to the airport, which is 70 miles away, and on to your next college where you're met by a deputation of students <laughs> and a, a faculty member. Now, just imagine, this goes on for 12 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing sort of six or seven colleges a week, and at the end of this time, you're completely bewildered. But also, I found that <clears throat> being an intensely subjective kind of person, you know, I like to get inside myself, and this kind of thing would just leave me so bewildered that towards the end of the 12 weeks, everything, you know, would begin to blur. And this awful sensation, you know, of meaninglessness, of what Sartre calls nausea. <laughs> <laughs> Now, <clears throat> I had an interesting and I think significant experience in its way when I was coming to America in 1966. Um, again, you know, I hated the idea of leaving home because um, my wife had just had another baby, um, so we, we had two. I, I'm a typical cancer. I hate leaving my home anyway. And um, I got onto the train on my way to London, on my way to New York, with that kind of despairing sense of all these bloody American students thinking, <laughs> I can't bear it, and a sinking feeling. And it was a very hot January day. It was warm, which, you know, is unusual in England, but Cornwall, where I live, tends to be the warmest part of England. And they turned on the train heating so that it was really hot. And I was feeling this state of despair as I was going towards London, that desire, you know, just not to do it. And I suddenly thought, my God, if I'm like this now, what shall I be like after, you know, just two or three weeks in America? And I had come to recognize that when you get yourself into these conditions of boredom, suddenly everything goes wrong. And I suddenly had an intuition that if I wasn't very careful indeed, I wasn't going to survive this trip. That's what killed Dylan Thomas. There's just no doubt about it. Anyway, on the um, journey to London, uh, you pass a place called Tingmouth on the coast of Devon. It's a beautiful spot, you know. You um, go along by the sea. And uh, as I was um, going past this, I remembered an event which had taken place 
some 12 years earlier and when I'd first known my present wife. We'd gone on holiday down to the West Country, hitchhiking from London, and unfortunately her curse hadn't come on and I was in a condition of tremendous tension because I'd already had to get married once for this reason. <laughs> and um, we stayed a night in the New Forest, another night near Exeter, and as we were wandering down towards the other end of Cornwall, I, was, I had that sinking, despairing feeling of, oh, God, you know, here we go all over again, the same dreary business. And, um, <laughs> and you know, thinking, you're never getting it anywhere as a writer if you keep having to support young ladies who get pregnant. <laughs> and um, as um, we were on our way down through um, Tingmouth, Joy vanished into the local ladies and spent half an hour there, as she normally does. And um, when she came up, we strolled along the beach. I felt increasingly depressed about this prospect of going back to London. And I said, listen, you know, if it hasn't come on by tomorrow, we'll go back to London. You better start jumping off tables and drinking gin and so on. <laughs> and Joy said, no, it came on an hour ago. And I said, you silly fucking bitch, why didn't you tell me so? But at the same time, I felt this immense relief. And at this moment, I was looking out over the sea towards the Dartmouth Peninsula, and I suddenly thought, my God, isn't it beautiful? And then I thought, <laughs> no, it's not beautiful, you're just relieved. <laughs> then I looked again, and I thought, no, that's not true. It really is beautiful. What had happened is obviously the relief had somehow opened me up. And I was taking things in. And this hit me with such force that I thought, my God, Never again will I assume that my stupid subjective emotions, which close the world to you, are really in the least bit significant. It really is beautiful in a quite objective, solid sense. And in fact, you know, the rest of that holiday was really superb be because of the feeling of sort of happiness and relief and so on. Now, this was um, 1954, and so... Uh, 12 years later, in 1966, there was I on my train on my way to London, despairing about the prospect of um, lecturing, and we passed the same spot on the beach where this had happened. I looked out of the window, I was sweating, I was sort of feeling upset and miserable, and I looked at the sea and I thought, isn't it stupid? I could see that it was beautiful, and now I see nothing whatsoever, just see and then a kind of rage overcame me, and I suddenly began to concentrate like a maniac. I stared at it. I sort of, luckily I was alone in the carriage, or I looked as if I was having an apoplectic, uh, apoplectic attack. My face went red. I screwed up my face. I screwed up my fists. And I stared and stared and stared. And I know exactly how long it took, because Dawlish, the next station, is exactly three minutes down the line. And before we actually got into Dawlish, quite suddenly, this incredible sense of doors opening, and suddenly, once again, it was beautiful. And this opening, which I'd done by sheer force of will, suddenly struck me as one of the most significant things that had ever happened to me. And I determined that, you know, I would not go back on this. I just wanted to keep the doors open. I got off in London in a far more wide awake and happy state than I'd got on in Cornwall, and then I crossed to New York. I even stopped drinking because I felt, you know, stupid to get myself into sort of vaguely woozy conditions when I wanted to keep this clarity. And for the first eight or nine weeks of the tour, I was absolutely superb. Whenever I was stuck on an airport with nothing to do, I'd take out my journals and write. I would concentrate and think, and I'd got it. I did it all the time. And then, you know, just the sheer repetitiousness and suddenly, you, you know, you spend one night too late and get into bed too late and have too much to drink. I, I started drinking again after three or four weeks of the tour, but you know my usual wine, that's all. And suddenly, the concentration's gone. And as soon as my concentration went, everything went wrong. It was as if all the misfortunes that had been waiting to pile on top of me now leapt on in one single heap. And, uh, you know, I lost my air tickets, I missed planes, you know, colleges I went to, uh, the audiences were, you know, completely out of sympathy. I remember drinking um, 
uh, drinking water, but I kept pouring it out of gin, a gin bottle at a Baptist college in Winston-Salem. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was disastrous. <laughs> and uh, I realized that as soon as you let go, in some weird way, the physical world itself reflects your sudden loss of motivation. This struck me as very significant indeed. But it was a long time before I began to see that this was not a purely subjective thing, you know, that in fact the objective world in some sense responds to your inner pressure, because that's what we're talking about. The objective world kind of pushes in on you from outside, like, you know, the air pressure on a balloon. If you put a balloon in a vacuum, it would just swell up and explode. We're not in a vacuum. We're operating in a real objective world. Therefore, you need a certain inner pressure to deal with it, and, you know, maybe after a few drinks or when you're just feeling euphoric, suddenly your inner pressure is equal to that of the external world upon you. And you have this strange feeling that you are on the verge, you know, of some kind of triumph. And then you let go and suddenly the pressure of the external world upon you is greater than your pressure on it. And this is our normal human condition. I am... Um, I realized that this could be done, and that taught me a great deal. A year later, I had to go to London on an overnight train, and the train broke down and was delayed for three or four hours, so that, in fact, I didn't get into London until something like 11 in the morning instead of 6 or 7. Then I had to go and see a film producer with a completely empty stomach, having had no time to eat. And he gave me a couple of glasses of whiskey. And I then had to catch the two o'clock train back from Paddington to Cornwall. And uh, when I got on the train, I was feeling drunk and now very, very tired, not having had enough sleep on the overnight train. And I bought a maigre or something of the sort at the bookstore, thinking I'd read this on the way home. And I realized, you know, that I really was not going to be able to read a book on the way home. I would get bored and tired. I suddenly thought, I'm about to waste five hours out of my life in a state of boredom. And then suddenly I remembered what had happened on that train going up to London on the way to America. And once again, I thought, well, you know, let's try it. Now, I was literally very, very tired physically this time, and I'd had two glasses of whiskey. So it wasn't sort of very easy this time, but once again, I sort of, as it were, clenched my will, stared out of the window of the train and gave it everything I'd got. And it took some time, but I didn't let go. I just kept on and on and on. And quite suddenly, a strange sort of sleepy, happy feeling began to come over me. And as we got out into the English countryside, I realized this curious fact that the grass had a kind of bluish tinge as if it were made of blue velvet. And quite suddenly, an enormous relaxation came over me, and everything was wonderful in a kind of gentle, soft, relaxed way, as if I were being deliberately soothed. And it stayed like this most of the way back to Cornwall. I suddenly realized that there are potentialities in the will itself which we simply fail to recognize, that mere intense concentration can do the trick. Now, this was very significant for me because, of course, this is what my first book, The Outsider, had been all about. I'd been fascinated by the romantics of the 19th century who had these sudden ecstatic visions in which everything appeared to be superb. You know, starting off um, in the 18th century with Goethe and Schiller and Wordsworth. Do you remember the episode in um, The Prelude of Wordsworth where he describes finding a boat on the edge of Lake Windermere, taking it out onto the lake in the middle of the night, and suddenly having the feeling that these enormous hills around have become living beings. And he uses this expression of a feeling of unknown modes of being. That later came to strike me as extremely significant, unknown modes of being. The basic mystical experience that there's somehow a gap between our human material world 
and this intenser world, so that language finds it extremely difficult even to begin to bridge it. Now, as soon as I began to recognize that this was the basic thing about the romantics, these strange melting moods, as William James calls them, in which everything is superb, and yet that when they woke up the next morning, it had gone completely. And they couldn't remember what they meant by that sort of feeling of, yes, yes. You know, yes what? And I could see that this is the basic problem. If only we could pin down not only what we mean by yes, but how to get back to the yes. That's the really significant problem. And so I wrote in The Outsider about these romantics who had this incredibly high suicide rate, simply because they'd experienced the ecstasies and then found, coming back to the ordinary world, such a bore that they just did not want to live. Like, you know, a child who's been got up so early in the morning that he's just tired and refuses to make an effort, just goes around yawning and rubbing his eyes. This was obviously the problem of the romantics. I could also see that if only one could analyze that experience of intensity deeply enough, then you begin to see the answer of how to recreate it. And that's the interesting question. Because if you could recreate it, then at least you could balance it against the feeling of misery and boredom, sort of place them side by side as if they were on two sides of a scale, and begin to judge them instead of feeling, well, they're just both feelings, and there's no way of judging between the two of them about which is true. That's why so many of the romantics committed suicide or died of boredom and despair, tuberculosis, stupid accidents. Because they couldn't arrive at any way of deciding which is true. Now, I had written in The Outsider, for example, about someone like Van Gogh, who struck me as the most significant example of this, because in a painting like The Starry Night, you get this immense sense of terrific vitality of the whole sky turning into great whirls of you know, sheer life and the, the trees surging up towards the heavens like flames. You can see as you look at that picture that as he was painting it, he had this feeling the whole universe is magnificent. So obviously magnificent that it should be possible to restore the vision at any time. I was also struck by a comment made by the head of BBC Music, Hans Keller, who had been in, he was a Jew and he was in Germany during the Nazi period, and he was watching people disappearing into concentration camps during the 1930s, and he said on this BBC talk that he'd said to himself, oh my God, if only I could get out of Germany, I swear I would never be unhappy again for the rest of my life. Now, Keller was a nasty little bastard, if ever there was one. He obviously did not succeed in living up to this vow. You know, he was a personal, nasty little man. And yet the fact remains that it was an important and interesting vision. He could suddenly see that it was possible. And of course, this is the problem. We get these visions and never live up to them. Never live up to that certainty that we experience in the moment of intensity. But does that mean that the moment of intensity is an illusion, a kind of, you know, drunken euphoria. From the beginning, I'd be convinced this was not so, because whenever you experience the moods of euphoria, it was exactly like going to the same hilltop and seeing the same identical vision from the top of a tower. You saw the same features that you'd seen before. In other words, these visions experienced by Van Gogh in paintings like The Starry Night and The Road with Cypresses were sort of bird's eye views looking down on life from above, and all of the rom romantics experienced them. Our ordinary view of life when we wake up in the morning, particularly when we're feeling dull, is a kind of worm's eye view. <laughs> and we accept this as the reality, because after all, in a certain sense, we're stuck in a kind of worm's eye view. You know, physically speaking, 
you are now sitting in this room, you can't see through the walls, you can't see, see through the ceiling, so you're in an extremely restricted environment and your senses only show you about 10 feet in any given direction. And yet, the fact remains that if you were sitting in this room holding a baby in your arms, the baby, in a way, would be even more restricted. You know, sort of much more easily bored, much more easily tired. And moreover, he wouldn't even understand what I'm talking about. So there'd be a far more limited sense. You are able, in a sense, to complete this room and what lies outside the room from your experience. And what's more, you are not merely using your memory of other times and other places <laughs> and comparing what I'm saying to your own experience. You're also using your imagination and your reason. And that's very interesting, this activity we have of completing the present moment through the use of the mind. Otherwise, we would be like animals. We'd be stuck in the present moment. When you're sitting in a room and your dog is lying at your feet asleep on the rug, the dog is merely in that room. And when he wakes up, he's still in that room. You, in fact, can be reading a book and be elsewhere. You're not really in the room at all. And what's more, if something suddenly reminds you of something outside the room, you can, for a brief moment, be in two places at once. Particularly, you know, if it's a smell or a taste that reminds you of it. This is this peculiar human capacity we have. Obviously, in some strange way, we are capable of being elsewhere. And one of the first things that struck me when I began writing about the so-called paranormal or occult in the 1960s was that this is yet another way of being elsewhere. The poet W.B. Yeats <coughs> said that one day he had to deliver a message to a student friend of his who was, in fact, a couple of hundred miles away that later the student said to him that he, Yates, had walked into the room and stood by him and said he would be seeing him later. And that Yates had then gone back late at night after the student had gone to bed and delivered the message. You find this story in his autobiography. Now, Yates had no knowledge whatsoever of doing that. And yet we can cite hundreds of cases of the same kind of thing. In the 1890s, they used to speak of these as so-called phantasms of the living. There's obviously something very, very peculiar about human beings. We appear to have this strange ability to do things that we ourselves cannot understand. <clears throat> we don't tend to do them when we're feeling very low and dull, and that's what struck me from the beginning. That is the problem. It's when you get interested, excited, that quite suddenly you go into a state that you might call all systems go. And as soon as you're in the all systems go state, quite instinctively you know how to do certain things. Almost certainly the reason that so many people see visions of their relatives on the point of death is that when you're on the point of death, you somehow know how to do it. You just go and appear to your relatives. And you could do it when you're not on the point of death, as Yeats did. It's a trick. And it's a trick that somewhere deep down inside is we all know already. And that, for me, is the really fascinating thing. We already know it. Not only that, you know, there are other peculiarities about human beings. Um, I love citing um, Oliver Sacks' story about the calculating prodigies in New York. You know, Sacks, this um, psychologist, sneaked up on these two idiot idiots who were in a New York mental home and heard them exchanging vast numbers. And he was curious enough to note down the numbers, which were all under 10,000, but which were pretty big. He suspected that they were primes, that is, numbers that can't be divided exactly by any other number, you know, like 5, 7, uh, 17, and so on. And um, when he got back home, he happened to have a dictionary of prime numbers of the first 20,000. He realized when he looked it up that every number these twins had been reciting to one another was, in fact, a prime. Now, the odd thing about prime numbers is that if you've got a very big one, there's no mathematical shortcut to finding out whether it's a prime or not. You just have to painfully divide every other number into it. And even a computer can't do it in any other way. <laughs>
And yet here were these twins smiling at one another and exchanging primes. So Sachs noted down some bigger primes. First of all, you know, some below 10,000 and then some in the range of 15, 16, 17, 18,000. He went back and stood by them the next day and he watched them smiling at one another and exchanging numbers like, you know, 8,761. The other one would smile and say, you know, 9,853. And then they'd smile at one another again, you see. And um, Sachs suddenly said, you know, 11,687. And they looked at one another, startled, and then suddenly their faces broke into broad beams. And uh, when Sachs went back later that morning, they were exchanging primes up in the 20,000 range. Now, this can't be done. <laughs> There's no way of doing it. What they were doing is somehow getting up in the air and looking down on the whole mathematical field of numbers. And there is no Darwinian way in which this can have happened. If we evolved sort of, you know, from amoeba up through apes and so on, we had never had any need to exchange 20,000 <laughs> word prime, number primes. And this is only one of many examples of these completely absurd powers that human beings appear to possess. This is what came to fascinate me so much. And as soon as I got into this study of the so-called paranormal, I could see that, in a way, it simply supplemented what I'd been writing for years about outsiders. Now, this question about the visions of outsiders, Van Gogh's Starry Night, and fascinated me because, as you know, Van Gogh had later committed suicide, leaving a suicide note saying, misery will never end, and then shot himself in the stomach. The question is, which was most true, the starry night or the suicide note? How could you determine, how could you devise a method by which, as I say, you could compare them? Now, philosophically speaking, what I was suggesting was meaningless. The logical positivists, or, you know, your American school of logic, Willard Quine and all these people would have said, you know, it's not a philosophical question, ask another. And I myself felt that it was a philosophical question, it had to be. Because, you know, I was trained as a scientist myself. I wanted to become a scientist. Unfortunately, I had to leave school at the age of 16. And um, I got so miserable at being forced to work in factories and offices that um, I began to read an enormous amount of poetry, and I found this would soothe me into these kind of universal moods of happiness. I would very quickly get into a state that I called gliding. It was as if you kind of got above the turbulence of the lower atmosphere into this state in which, quite suddenly, you were just sailing along, gently and happily. And quite suddenly, you realize that the problems you'd been experiencing all day long were problems of the lower atmosphere. And if you could just learn this trick of getting up above them, everything was suddenly fine. Now, this seemed to me so much more important than anything I might have done in science that I felt that I wanted to devote my life to answering this question, which is why I got so interested in the whole question of outsiders and the 19th century romantics and Van Gogh and Nijinsky and Nietzsche and so on. So, the question I asked myself in The Outsider was, okay, how can we determine which is true? And then, in 1958, I received a letter from an American psychologist called Abraham Maslow, in which he said that he'd read my book, The Stature of Man, in which I'd complained that all modern literature tended to end with a sense of defeat, that if you were really realistic, you ended with defeat. In fact, a student yesterday that I was talking to said that in his literature class there was a book that had this parallel. Um, if you're writing absurd fantasy, it ends with ev everything ending happily ever after. If you're writing realistically, it ends with the death and defeat of your leading characters. <laughs> and I have complained about this in my book, The Age of Defeat, which came out here in America as the Stature of Man, because the American publisher wanted an upbeat title. <laughs> <laughs> Maslow read this and wrote to me, sending me this stuff of his, um, in which he said that he had got sick 
of studying sick people, because sick people talked about nothing but their sickness, so he decided to study the healthiest people he could find. He asked among his friends, who's the healthiest person you know? They put him onto healthy people. He got a whole group of them together and proceeded to study them and quickly made this discovery, which no one else had ever made before, which was that all these healthy people had so-called peak experiences, these bubbling experiences of sheer overwhelming happiness, which were not in any way mystical experiences or religious experiences. They were just sudden, you know, sheer happiness, a kind of what you might call spring morning feeling in which everything is self-evidently lovely. The interesting thing, of course, about the peak experience being that quite suddenly you seem to open up and the real world hits you with a conviction of its reality, whereas before you were kind of stuck inside your own head in a purely personal state like having blocked sinuses. <laughs> and I was fascinated by Maslow's description of um, his students talking to him about peak experiences. He said that one young man was working his way through college as a jazz drummer, and that one morning at about two o'clock in the morning, he suddenly began to drum so perfectly that he just could not do a thing wrong, and he went into the peak experience. Um, he said a hostess who'd just given a very successful party, looking around the room at the cigarette butts trampled into the carpet and the wine spilt on the armchairs, nevertheless suddenly thought, my God, that was a good party, and went into the peak experience. Now, you, you notice that, by the way, she, that she looked back on it and thought, my God, that was a good party. That sense, you know, that things are okay and that you have achieved something. It's always this sense that brings on the peak experience. Um, but more significant, he told me about a Marine who'd come from the South Pacific without having seen a girl for several years. And when he saw a nurse back at base, he went into the peak experience. <laughs> but not because of any sexual reason, it suddenly hit him that women are different from men. <laughs> he said, you know, we think we know it, we take it for granted, but it's not true we know it. He said, you know, it suddenly hit him. Women are different from men, just as cows are different from horses. They're almost a different species. And as soon as he saw this with that reality, he went into the peak experience. Now, this fascinated me. Obviously, Maslow had gone on to something very important when he said that healthy people had peak experiences, you know, with a fair degree of frequency. Most of them had them every day. Because it was perfectly obvious that the reason they had peak experiences was that they were highly motivated. They were keeping themselves, so to speak, driving forward. Whereas my romantics were always getting themselves into these states in which they felt the world was pointless. And then, like me, on my way to America in 1966, they were tempted to go, Ugh and just completely let out their inner pressure. And as I say, what we are talking about is pressure. If you are walking out, let's say, on a cliff on a windy day in the rain, and you are suddenly exhilarated by it, the reason you are exhilarated is that these external stimuli suddenly provoke you into putting out a kind of pressure, and suddenly your pressure is slightly greater than that of the wind and the rain. And you have this sort of feeling of hooray. Whereas, of course, if you've just come out from sitting in front of a fire feeling rather low and bored. On the contrary, you know, you just want to shrink further within yourself. And you see that shrinking movement is releasing your pressure. It's quite simply a matter of inner pressure, as simple as that. But what also struck me as so significant is that Maslow said his students began remembering peak experiences they'd had and forgotten about. The interesting thing being that when we get into these curiously happy states, we take them totally for granted. Excuse me. We assume, you know, that uh, it's, well, okay, life is nice. Isn't it pleasant? And then we go on to do the next thing we've got to do, as if an obstacle has been removed. What we fail to realize is that the reason that pain and misery affect us so deeply is that, as it were, we focus upon them. And because we focus upon them, we, so to speak, take them into ourselves and register them in our nervous system. We do the opposite with happiness, and we don't register them in our nervous system. And obviously we should be doing it the opposite way around. We should be holding the pain and misery at bay, ignoring them and not letting them into the nervous system. And when we are really happy or relieved, really taking that into the nervous system, when the lavatory has been out of order for a week and the plumber finally comes, this is the time to sort of leap up and down shouting hallelujah 
and really take it into your nervous system by reflecting upon it. When you're extremely tired and you've got guests and they stay until half past midnight and you're longing to get to bed, when you get into bed, don't fall asleep. Lie there thinking, God, isn't it wonderful? And take it into your nervous system when you're really hungry, when you sort of badly want to go to the lavatory. In all these cases of relief, reflect upon it as you do on a freezing winter morning when you've got to get up in five minutes and the bed has never seemed so marvelously warm and comfortable. You, you realize that on a Saturday morning when you can stay in bed all morning, you can never revive that feeling, no matter how hard you try. Somehow, you know, you pushed a button in yourself which says, oh, it's okay, it's just Saturday. And it's very difficult to overcome this feeling. And yet it can be done. Somehow the nervous system will learn tricks. And once it's learned these tricks forcibly enough, it will repeat them over and over again. You remember, you know, my favorite story of the um, Hindu Saint Ramakrishna, who in a state of absolute despair because he couldn't see the Divine Mother, seized a sword and was about to drive it through himself, when suddenly he said the Divine Mother revealed herself and he was overcome by waves of sheer vitality and affirmation which um, raised him into samadhi. And from then on, the mere name of the Divine Mother was enough to send him into samadhi. His nervous system had learned the trick. Now, the interesting thing was that Maslow's students did the same thing. As soon as they began to talk to one another about peak experiences and reflected on peak experiences they'd had in the past, they began having peak experiences all the time. Exactly like Ramakrishna. Why? Because they were talking and thinking about them. And what's more, you can see from this, the peak experience is not an emotion. It's not like drinking alcohol or, you know, taking drugs or sort of otherwise getting yourself into a state about something. The peak experience is a perception. Maslow told a story of a young mother who was watching her husband and children eating breakfast when a beam of sunlight came in through the window and she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky? Perception. Because she was lucky. But a moment before she'd been lucky and not known it, now suddenly she saw she was lucky and she went into the peak experience. The peak experience is like looking sideways and seeing your face in the bathroom mirror. You suddenly say, my God, I'm lucky. And it's a moment before you weren't aware of yourself, and now suddenly you are aware of yourself and the, your luckiness. And into the peak experience you go. There's this curious element of self-reflection in it. Now, as soon as I began to see all these things, I began to see that these romantics who committed suicide and got themselves into states of boredom and misery were, in fact, not sufficiently analytical to understand what I was now understanding. They just did not have the verbal tools in 1830 to understand what was happening to them. All they can understand is that they were in moods of wonderful ecstasy in which the whole universe was self-evidently beautiful. Then the next morning they were low and miserable. They had just no way of comparing the two states. And as the low and miserable states tended to go on much longer than the ecstasies, they naturally assumed that they were realer and truer. What struck me from the beginning was that as soon as you can begin to reflect on these two, you are already beginning to understand how to recreate the peak experience at will. It's like, imagine a sort of um, young king who has two advisors, one of whom is absolutely boring and dreary and advises him always to take the cautious approach. The other one of whom is sort of immensely optimistic. He'd much rather take the advice of the optimistic one, but unfortunately the optimistic one is only there one day a year, and the dreary and boring one is there 364 days. And if he takes the advice of the optimistic one, he's going to be nagged for the other 364 days by the dreary one for exposing himself to all kinds of problems and dangers. Now, in fact, the answer is not to take the advice of the dreary one, the, the answer is obviously to determine you're digging your heels and say no. And if you dig them in firmly enough, you suddenly discover that the optimistic advisor will stay with you two days a year, then three days a year, then four days a year. That the mere act of will on your part makes it possible to recreate the moods of optimism at will. <laughs>
And this is obviously the basic trick. You see, the 19th century wasn't sufficiently analytical to understand this. One of the most important insights I ever came across was one I received from the writer Robert Audrey, who told me about two scientists called Rubenstein and Best, who were doing experiments with planarian worms. Now, as you know, planaria, planaria are the simplest of all creatures. They sort of uh, they've got no brain, no nervous system, no stomach, no nothing. And they can also reproduce very, very quickly, so that you can test generation after generation in a matter of weeks or months. Now, these two were trying to discover something very odd about the planarian worm, which is the fact that if you teach one of them something like how to avoid a red-hot wire and take another way, and then you chop it up and feed it to other planaria, the other planaria suddenly know how to avoid the red-hot wire. Colleagues, something puzzling happened. The planaria suddenly started choosing the wrong turn. And this baffled them. And then, after a while, when they turned the tap, the planaria would just lay there as if saying, oh, God, no, not again, <laughs> and prefer to die rather than go looking for the water. <laughs> so Rubinstein said, well, maybe they're getting bored. And the other one said, don't be stupid. How can they get bored? They've got no brain, no nervous system, no, no nothing. But they devised an experiment to test this hypothesis, and what they did was take two tubes. One was made of rough plastic inside, and the other one was made of smooth plastic. In the rough plastic tube, the water was down the lighted alleyway, in the smooth tube, it was down the dark alleyway. And they took a new lot of planaria and they transferred them from tube to tube in between the experiments. Now, this was twice as difficult. And only the, about sort of 54% of the planaria learned which way to react in the different tubes. But that 54% never regressed. You could do the experiment a million times and they never got bored and they never took the wrong turning. Because they'd been forced to put twice as much energy into the learning process, suddenly they were at that higher level of vitality where, as soon as the water was drained off, they went and found it. Now, it struck me there's an analogy here for human beings. Our problem is simply we've achieved civilization far too easily. And we're in this sort of wonderful, comfortable civilization after millions of years of sort of struggling for survival against horrible weather wild animals and so on, and then quite suddenly, in something, you know, like two and a half centuries, the world has changed so much that we are in these highly comfortable circumstances. And it's happened too quickly, and like the first lot of planaria, we're finding it all a little too boring. What's more, we know this instinctively, and we quite deliberately start wars and try to create other difficult conditions to force us to put twice as much effort into life. We somehow instinctively realize this is the answer. It's what Edgar Allan Poe called the imp of the perverse. And obviously, to some extent, this can be self-destructive. What we've got to learn is a more simple and logical way of doing this. William James talked about what he called the moral equivalent of war. In other words, the imaginative equivalent of war. A way of raising yourself to a higher level of intensity without the need to start hitting people. And from the beginning, I could see this was the answer. James said that he'd spent um, 10 days in the Chautauqua community in New York State, kind of idealistic community, you know, with beautiful scenery, marvellous sort of food, in ideal surroundings, and everybody being nice to one another and sort of talking about religion and philosophy. And he said when he left this after ten days, he thought, how nice, then a kind of, oof, thank God to be out of there. <laughs> and he said on his way, driving back into New York, seeing these half-built skyscrapers with men sort of up on girders up in the sky, he thought, thank God to be back in a real world with real struggle. And obviously, the same reason as the double ambiguity planaria. Somehow we have this longing for reality, because reality rise, raises us to this higher and intenser level. And suddenly, the higher and intenser level gives us control over ourselves. And this is obviously what we are talking about. This is what the Romantics didn't realize, that it is simply a matter of control, 
and of grasping, as it were, analytically the problems that you are dealing with. Now, this struck me as fascinating because if it's a matter of grasping the problems analytically, this means using, you know, reason and logic. And somehow we all distrust this intensely. We feel that using reason and logic is sure to you know, get us into the wrong boat and lead us totally in the wrong direction. We sort of believe, like, you know, D.H. Lawrence and Walt Whitman and Henry Miller and all these other people, you know, the intuitions tell you the truth and reason always lies to you. And yet, you can see that as soon as you begin to apply reason to this question, quite suddenly, you can see that clearly peak experiences are a human norm, and moreover, that we can all have them whenever we like, provided we understand how they're created. So that was what I started to work upon after I'd heard from Maslow. Now, I met Maslow for the first time when I went to Brandeis University in about 1966. And when I talked to him about this, about recreating the peak experience at will, Maslow said, unfortunately, it's impossible. It can't be done. He said, you know, they come when they want to and they go when they want to. And the harder you try... You know, the less successful you are. Reason just will not create the peak experience. And I said, but you seem to be contradicting yourself in a way. You were saying that we are far more free than we realize, that human beings, that human nature has been sold short by Freud, claiming, you know, that we're basically a number of sort of appalling, nasty impulses which lie around in the basement of the subconscious mind. And... Yet, you are saying we cannot recreate the peak experience at will. If you are right about higher ceilings of human nature, surely it means higher ceilings of what you might call self-creation. And Maslow said, well, I agree with you theoretically, but it, practically speaking, it can't be done. Now, this was the question to which I applied myself. And, you know, there were a number of fundamental clues one of these clues is the one, you know, that I'm afraid I've always talked about, and anybody who's heard me before will yawn with boredom when I bring it up, but Graham Greene had discovered how to create the peak experience at will. In his teens, he had fallen, apparently, into a state of extreme boredom after being successfully psychoanalyzed. And <laughs> he said that the characteristic of this state was that he would look at things which he could see visually were beautiful, but he would feel absolutely nothing whatever. And that in this state of perpetual boredom and dullness, um, he somehow just could not arouse himself to any enthusiasm about life. And then he said he found this um, revolver belonging to his brother in a corner cupboard, took it out onto Berkhamstead Common and played Russian roulette, put one bullet in the chamber, spun them, pointed it at his head and pulled the trigger. And he said when there was just a click... He looked down the barrel and saw the bullet had now come into position. So he'd missed death by just one. And he said immediately he felt an overwhelming feeling of sheer happiness. He said he could suddenly see that life is incredibly beautiful and complex and exciting. He said it was as if a light had been turned on. Now, if you turn on a light, what you see is what was there before you turned on the light. So in a sense, Green was saying life is incredibly beautiful and exciting. And yet he then went on to say that he tried it six more times <laughs> until he said the drug ceased to work. Now you can see he's changed his image. Suddenly we're onto a drug, in other words, alcohol or whatever, that gives you a, complete, a completely false illusion of what it's all about. Now, when I first read that, I suppose I was a teenager, I could immediately see that he'd stumbled upon something of tremendous importance. And everything I began to read after this about the near-death experience, the crisis experience, confirmed me in this insight. That somehow the answer lay in pushing yourself to a certain point where you might say the real you suddenly breaks through. Now, at a fairly early stage, I could see that the real problem is a part of the human being that you might call the robot. Inside you, 
you've got a kind of mechanical valet or servant who does things for you. And he's incredibly efficient. That's the reason that human beings are the highest beings on the surface of the planet. We have a more efficient robot than any other creature. And you can teach yourself to type painfully, key by key, and suddenly the robot takes it over and types much faster than you could consciously. You learn to ski or to drive a car or to speak a foreign language, and the robot takes it over and does it instantaneously for you. The only trouble is you can't interfere with him once he'd learned it. Um, for example, uh, someone once said to a friend of mine, who used to be a brilliant dart player, um, how do you hold a dart when you throw it? And he suddenly found he couldn't let the dart go. He was trying to do this, and he couldn't open his fingers at the right moment. If you try to interfere with the robot once he's taken over, you completely screw him up. Now, I realized that, in fact, the robot is obviously the answer to this basic problem. That's the real trouble about when we're talking about your pressure against the pressure of the external world. Because as soon as you're tired, it's like a thermostat on the wall taking over. There's a click, and quite suddenly you're doing things robotically. You see, the robot not only does the things you want him to do, like driving a car and talking French, he also says, does the things you don't want him to do, like listening to a symphony that deeply moves you, or enjoying a good meal, or, you know, reading a poem that moves you. The tenth time you do it, the robot is doing it instead of you. And suddenly you're just no longer enjoying it. And this is the trouble. The robot keeps taking over what we do. But you notice he works on a thermostat. And if your thermostat is too low, like that of the romantics, if you feel that the whole of life is fundamentally dull and boring, and you let your inner pressure go very low, then obviously the robot switches on much more easily and takes over from you. Now, you could say that what you might call the real you is kind of, you know, 48% of your being, and the robot is normally 52% so that he does most of your living for you. He's got to, or you wouldn't survive. You know, if an Elizabethan could come into the 20th century and meet an American workman or an English workman, he would think they were godlike beings because they can handle such a complexity of experience. They can sort of read and write and use language in a way that would strike him as, you know, being sheer genius. And yet, the modern man has done this because his robot is so efficient. So we keep having to rise up above the robot to do any real creative work. It becomes, in a sense, harder and harder work. You know, the Elizabethan was probably, as it were, 49% real him and only 51% robot. Now, what happens is that when you are placed in a position of crisis and you know that you've got to make an effort, you push yourself up that extra 1% or 2% and suddenly you and the robot are on the same level. That's what happened to Maslow's healthy people. You know, a young mother enjoying being married, enjoying having her own car and going to the supermarket and looking after the babies and all this kind of thing, is highly motivated. And the result is that although the robot takes over whenever she's tired, she's so enjoying her life as a young mother that, you know, she gets the spring morning feeling. And the two are perfectly balanced. And now suddenly the beam of sunlight comes in through the window. She thinks, my God, aren't I lucky? And suddenly she is overbalancing the robot. And suddenly everything is superb. The peak experience. It's quite clear that we are far closer to the peak experience than we think. And what's more, if you observe yourself carefully enough, you can tell how close or far you are. You know, the, these devices you use on your car tyre to find out what the pressure in it is, and you suddenly realize that you're 10 pounds below the proper pressure, and then you, ju you just use the thing at the garage and put more air into it. Now, if we had a similar thing to attach to the human brain in the morning, and you could suddenly see, you know, that you're three pounds down, and you had a device you could just stick into your head and shoot yourself up, we'd all instantly become supermen, because that's all it is. As simple as that. That's why I say I'm almost ashamed to talk about it. It's so obvious and simple. That's all it amounts to. When your pressure is way up, you are happy. When you let it go down, and it's a matter of letting it go down, then suddenly the world oppresses you.
as soon as I began to see that, I began to see that to begin with, it's obviously a very simple matter of a kind of vigilance, of watching yourself, of watching when you begin to think, and actually making that effort to push yourself up that extra degree. William James talked about second wind. He said, we all know what it is to wake up some mornings with that feeling as if a cloud weighed upon us, keeping our faculties you know, below their proper level of intensity, keeping our judgment below its proper level of perceptivity. And that, as soon as we experience these curious little flashes of intensity, of happiness, we quite suddenly rise above these states. And moreover, if you're very tired and you force yourself deliberately to try and push yourself into a higher state, first of all, you experience acute distress, like sort of trying to do too many push-ups, and then quite suddenly, excuse me, you break through into what William James called second wind. And suddenly, everything is superb. Second wind is the peak experience. And James went on to say that you could have third wind, fourth wind, as many winds as you like, provided each time you're willing to push yourself to that level of pain and break through. And he said that the people um, that in those days they called neurasthenics, uh, that now I suppose you know we call neurotics and so on, are simply people who keep pausing on this side of that pain barrier and saying, oh no, and letting themselves collapse, letting that inner energy out letting themselves leak exactly like a leaking tire. And the trouble with human beings is that if they leak too much, it has exactly the same effect as trying to drive on a flat tire. You wreck yourself in no time at all. Whereas, if you keep yourself pumped up hard like a tire, you last ten times as long. You think of anybody you know who's lived a very long time, it's quite obvious that this is the secret of their long life. Somehow quite instinctive, they just keep themselves pumped up in this odd way. You know, keep inflated hard. And that's the answer. But the question remained, was Maslow right when he said you cannot achieve the peak experience at will? If Graham Greene was able to do it by pointing a gun at his head and pulling the trigger, Surely, I thought, there's a mechanism there. And, moreover, I came across another interesting clue in Wordsworth. In De Quincey's Reminiscences of the Lake Poets, De Quincey describes how one day he said to Wordsworth, um, how do you get these poetic experiences of yours? And Wordsworth said, I don't know, I just can't explain. But later, they went to meet the cart coming from Keswick with the mail, and Wordsworth got down and put his ear to the ground to listen for the rumbling sound of the cart. When he heard nothing, he straightened up, saw the first star of the evening in the sky, and suddenly experienced this overwhelming happiness, the feeling of its great beauty. And he said to De Quincey, Now I can tell you, whenever I'm totally concentrated on something that has nothing whatever to do with poetry, and then I let go... Whatever I see as I let go appears to me beautiful. And when I read that, I suddenly saw the connection between Graham Greene and Wordsworth. You see, Greene is in this sort of floppy, wide-open, bored, depressed state of kind of... Ugh. He points the gun at his head and pulls the trigger and suddenly goes... Ugh. And then there's just a click and he goes... Whew. And whatever he sees as the, you go... Whew appears incredibly beautiful. He suddenly sees that the universe is self-evidently infinitely exciting and marvellous. So, I began trying this myself. I realised that, in a sense, um, when Joy had said that she wasn't pregnant, I, I mean, I'd been in this state of, you know, God, we've got to go back to London. And then when she said that, I went, Whew! and everything I saw was beautiful, and it really was beautiful. It was an objective perception. And I saw that if, in fact, we can do this, followed by this, then we've got the answer. And so I began to practice this quite deliberately. I realized, for example, that particularly when you're tired, you get this feeling inside your head as if you don't want to concentrate anymore. All you want to do is to let go and relax. 
And at these times, I would try concentrating intently, and it always hurt. You know, the way it does if, for example, you've walked a long way the day before, so your muscles are tired, and then you force yourself to make an effort with tired muscles, that sort of agony you experience with tired muscles stretching. You get the same thing inside your brain. I discovered that if, in fact, you concentrate really intently, when you are in that tired state, then suddenly you have the peak experience. In fact, I even devised this extremely simple way of doing it with just an ordinary pen. You just take, you know, pen, hold it up against a blank surface like a wall or a ceiling, and first of all, you concentrate totally and intently upon the pen, and then you let yourself relax, so you see the ceiling against it. Then again, you concentrate like mad on the pen, and then you relax. And keep on doing that. Don't, you know, do it for too long. Concentrate for 10 seconds until you're really seeing nothing but the pen, as if you've got a gun to your head, and then open up. And you'll find that when you've done it quite a few times, you begin to get exactly that same slightly breathless feeling inside your head that you get if you try do, doing push-ups. You just want to stop. And when you want to stop, go on. Force yourself to do it two or three more times. And suddenly, second wind and the peak experience. Now, I saw that in a sense this is an interesting technique. And yet, funnily enough, when I used to talk to it, to, uh, about it to students, for example, when I was uh, working at a girls' school in Virginia in the 1960s, they admitted to me later that even though I'd now explained it, they still didn't do it. You know, it felt oh, an interesting observation, but they didn't actually try it. I found that what was essential was to actually make them try it in class, force them to do it until they saw that it worked and believed that it worked. And then, of course, they would start doing it. I also discovered an interesting parallel trick. I'd been taught by a pupil of Wilhelm Reich about Reich's method of breathing. Reich believed that we're surrounded by a kind of vital energy which he called orgone energy, and that when you breathe in deeply, you're breathing in orgone energy as well as oxygen. And Reich somehow believed that <coughs> instead of just breathing out the orgone energy, you can trap it by an act of will and force it down through your body. And as you breathe out, Reich made his students lie on the floor and say, out, that was down through the solar plexus, down, that was through the genitals, through, and that was through the feet. So you make them breathe in very deeply to the bottom of their lungs and they say, out, down, through. And she taught me to do this, and I found that this was, you know, an extremely interesting experience. <coughs> When you do this, you actually begin to get a feeling of feel a kind of glow, as if you're getting a kind of little golden deposit on all your muscles as you breathe out. And then, as you breathe in again and do it again, another little layer of gold goes over all the muscles. And within, you know, half a dozen breaths, you experience this sort of lovely sensation. First of all, you get a kind of glow in the genitals, like sexual excitement. Um, then it goes down through your thighs and through the backs of the legs and out through your feet and then it begins to come into the solar plexus later on and it begins to pass through the whole body. And you get this wonderful feeling of the whole body being permeated with this, permeated with this curious golden glow. Now, one day, I'd got my students lying on the floor doing the pen trick. And I said to them, I got them holding the pen up against the ceiling and staring intently and then saying, OK, now, let go. And, you know, you do it slowly until you see the whole ceiling around it. Then, OK, concentrate, as if your lives depended on it. Now let go. And when you do this in a few times, as I say, it begins to make you tired. Then I remembered how the Reikian breathing relaxes you. And so merely as an experiment to stop them from getting so tired, I said, OK, now, at the same time, let's try Reikian breathing. Now, they sound absolutely opposite. And we began to do this. I said, now, when you concentrate, you breathe in. And concentrate for as long as you breathe in. Okay, breath right to the bottom of your lungs, as deep as you can go. Now, 
Okay, let go. And as you let go, breathe out slowly. Out, down, through. Okay. Breathe in and concentrate. And so we went on. Now, I was lying on the floor with the rest of them. And I suddenly found myself going into a deep, intense, happy state of total relaxation. And it was so happy that, you know, I was just contented to lie there. And it went on and on. And finally, I suddenly looked at my watch and said, my God, lunch started half an hour ago, come on. And we all leapt to our feet and went off. And I realized I discovered a fundamental discipline. It's an extremely simple one. But, you know, ever since then, I've been using this. And it's amazing that once you're in this curious, floating, totally happy state, um, you can also envisage all kinds of things. It seems to create a state of what Jung calls active imagination, in which your body participates in the imagining, as well as your mind. And the whole thing begins to work. Now, this was all very interesting. But, in a certain sense, it wasn't what I was after. <laughs> it's very nice getting yourself into these states of intensity and happiness and so on. But, in a certain way, once you've kind of got used to the fact that you can do it, um, it becomes something you just do over and over again. Um, when I was at Esalen a few days ago, I spent the afternoon um, getting them to do Reiki and breathing in the pen trick. I'd got myself into this totally relaxed state, and my wife said that she bought me a massage. And, you know, I've never had a massage before. We live in the heart of Cornwall, and there are no masseurs. Anyway, I went down and had a massage, and it was very pleasant, but it didn't make the slightest difference, because I, I was already in such a deep state of total relaxation that she couldn't make me relax anymore. So, in, in a certain sense, I don't mind being uncomfortable because that concentrates my mind. And it's when my mind is concentrated that I do my best thinking. So, in a sense, all of this stuff of the pen trick and Reiki and breathing is slightly irrelevant. It's useful to know, very useful. And I'm pretty sure that anybody who used it constantly would never have any real problems. Reich, of course, believed that you couldn't possibly get cancer if you use this Reiki in breathing, because he thought that cancer is due to a kind of blockage of your vital energies, and that wherever there's a blockage, that quite suddenly you get all of the problems. Now, what struck me as so important is that it's not the ability to recreate the peak experience that matters, it's what consciousness can grasp and hold on to from the peak experience. And that strikes me as the really interesting thing. Because I had noticed again and again that just like Maslow's students, I would have sudden intensity experiences and then forget them. And then maybe a year later, something would remind me of what had happened. And because I'm a very persistent verbalizer, and I try to put them into words when they happened, I'd often go back to my journals or tapes I sometimes use and find them and realize that they were still there. And now, you see, I'm coming to what I regard as the really important part. I could see that the peak experience doesn't matter. What matters is what you know intellectually about the peak experience. You think, a child who has security in a family is sort of perfectly happy, but the security is only a background for what he's going to do with his life. The security is a marvelous starting point. And provided he knows, you know, emotionally and intellectually that he's secure, then he can go on and do interesting things. And sometimes, of course, he's far better off being insecure because it provokes him to make a far greater effort. W. H. Auden once asked what was the aim of education, said to provoke the highest degree of neurosis you can without the child cracking. <laughs> and admittedly, this does take you up, as it were, to higher levels of effort. So that struck me as being the really significant thing. Somehow, it's what you can learn intellectually from the peak experience, hold on to, and then, as it were, grip tightly. Now, Last time 
I was driving up from Esalen just over a year ago, I suddenly, just for the fun of it, began to say to myself, how many levels of ordinary human consciousness can I distinguish? And I just began to think about this for the pure fun of it, with no real sort of intellectual seriousness. I thought, okay, well, you can distinguish, you know, let's say level naught is being unconscious. So, okay, obviously, when consciousness begins to return, for example, when you've fallen into a very deep sleep, that's level one. It's the kind of dream level, or all things you experience within sleep. Let's call those all level one. So, okay, what's level two? Well, level two is obviously um, what you experience when you're very tired. You're seeing things, but somehow you don't take them in. In, in other words, there's no you to observe them. You know, think of a very tired child being brought back from a party. He sees things, and yet he doesn't see them. If you said, what have you just seen? He'd say, I don't know. So, level three is the level in which you appear and begin to take things in. You're aware of your identity, and you're also aware of the world around you. And yet, because your inner pressure is still low, the world lies so heavily upon your senses that you find it awfully hard work. This is the state that sat called nausea. This kind of feeling, you know, of the sheer weight of the world and the meaninglessness. The sort of feeling, you know, what am I doing here in this completely pointless world? Now, this, of course, is the state in which most of these so-called existential philosophers have written their books. Do you remember Kierkegaard says in one of um, his books, um, he says, one sticks one's finger into the earth to find out where one is. You know, French peasants can actually distinguish different places by the actual smell of the earth. He says, I stick my finger into existence and smell it. It smells of nothing. He says, what am I doing here? Who put me into this world? Why didn't they ask my permission before, me, before bringing me here? What am I supposed to do when I am here? Um, take me to see the director. I demand to see the director. <laughs> now, there is level three, that feeling of pure pointlessness. You know, what the hell are we doing here? Nausea. Now, in that case, what is level four? Level four is clearly our ordinary, everyday human consciousness. Your pressure is up higher. You're now going about your job. You know you've got to do certain things. Um, you no longer have this feeling of, what the hell am I doing here? Um, in fact, you know, you have a sort of sense of meaning. But nevertheless, it's still pretty hard work. And if things are against you, you experience depression and so on, and you sink down towards the lower end of level four. You know, that poem of Emily Bronte's, Does the Road Wind Uphill All the Way Right to the Very End? This is ordinary, everyday human consciousness. And yet, we all experience these curious moods in which suddenly, you know, things begin to go right. And you know that obstacles are beginning to disappear. And quite suddenly, in ordinary, everyday consciousness, without any mystical visions or anything of the sort, you just get that curious feeling of inner triumph, the knowledge that it's going to be all right. This seems to me, as it were, to be the upper end of level four. And at that upper end are all Maslow's peakers, all these healthy people who are highly motivated and who keep up that sufficient pressure against the external world to stay in this state of equilibrium with the pressure of events against their senses. And what's more, in those moments, when suddenly the sun comes in through the window and they say, my God, aren't I lucky, up they go into the next level. Now, notice this interesting thing. Towards the top end of level four, the level of the healthy people who have peak experiences, think of Maslow's young mother Okay, she's giving her husband and children breakfast. She's highly motivated. And yet, you know, she's not in the peak experience. Suddenly she thinks, aren't I lucky? And goes into the peak experience. But you notice, she was lucky before she had the peak experience. The peak experience is becoming aware 
of how lucky she is, like seeing her face in a mirror. She was lucky before. Do you remember at the end of Camus' novel, L'Etranger, uh, translated as a stranger in the American edition, that Camus' hero goes through the novel in apparently a state of awful boredom. He sort of starts off, you know, my mother died this morning. Then he just goes on, you know, I smoked a cigarette, I went to the cinema, I came home, I went to sleep, I got up, I went to work. It all sounds absolutely flat and boring. And then he's arrested for a murder he didn't really commit or committed accidentally. Sentenced to death because the prosecuting lawyer points out that he appeared not to cry at his mother's funeral and to be completely indifferent. <laughs> and um, when he's in the prison cell, he suddenly loses his temper with the priest trying to persuade him to repent, grabs him by the throat and tries to choke the life out of him, and then suddenly feels much better. And staring out of the window after the priest has gone at the night sky, he has this peak experience and says, I suddenly realized that I had been happy and I was happy still. And yet if you read the novel, you wouldn't dream he was happy. It sounds absolutely bored. Can you be happy and not realize it? Obviously, you can. That's what happened to Maslow's young mother. She was happy, but it wasn't until, she, as it were, the beam of sunlight came in and she said, aren't I happy, aren't I lucky, that she went into the peak experience. We're already potentially in the peak experience. All that is required is that self-reflective moment of rational awareness that you are lucky. That was the most interesting insight of all. We were already, so to speak, in the peak experience. Now, the peak experience is that little leap between level four and the next level upwards. And of course, the next level upwards, level five, is quite obviously, you know, what happens in the peak experience. You're feeling on a spring morning that the whole world is self-evidently beautiful. And the interesting thing about this is that you have opened up and the world is suddenly coming in. It hits you as a reality. You know, my favorite um, example being the famous one from Proust's novel Recherche du Temps Perdu in Swan's Way, where he comes in from a long walk feeling tired and low. His mother gives him a cup of tea and a little cake called a madeleine. He dips the madeleine in the tisane, tastes this stuff, and says, suddenly, an exquisite pleasure invaded my senses. Suddenly, I'd ceased to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. And as he experiences this weird feeling of sheer ecstatic happiness, he tries to remember why, and then remembers that as a child, his aunt used to give him a madeleine dipped in her herb tea. And that this has suddenly revived his childhood with total reality. Time has disappeared. And in that moment, he, as it were, can say, yes, I was a child, and mean it with his whole being. And it's that sudden recognition of the meaninglessness of time, so to speak, the fact that we have duration that suddenly causes us to cease to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. Now, the interesting thing is you can see in all those moments when, so to speak, you taste your own biscuit dipped in tea or smell something or hear a tune or whatever that causes the peak experience, you open up and the external world walks into you. And at the same time, something rises from your depths towards the external world, a sort of bubble of sheer joy. In all of the lower levels, you are kind of trapped, as I say, inside yourself. You are in that state, you know, as if you had blocked sinuses and can't breathe. You're, it's as if you were in a little room with all the doors closed. Somebody in one of Dostoevsky's novels says he suspects that eternity will turn out to be a little tiny room full of cobwebs. And this is an image of the human mind as we normally experience it. We are like someone who can handle the world by using a computer. And we stand in our little computer room inside our heads with these brilliant computer simulations, imagining that we are handling reality. And what's more, it's not a new thing. Sort of 2,500 years ago, Ecclesiastes was saying, vanity of vanities, there is nothing new under the sun. He was mistaking the computer for reality. That's up to level four. And suddenly on level five, the real world breaks in. And as soon as that happens, 
you have this immense feeling of sheer joy. The knowledge that this, is, this enormous power is there for you to draw upon. Now, what is, then is level six? Level six is obviously the spring morning feeling of level five, but made more or less permanent. The spring morning feeling lasts, you know, if you're lucky, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, then it's gone. But imagine a young couple on honeymoon, let's say, you know, in a Swiss hotel with everything absolutely perfect and the feeling that life is good, and they stay up on that level for days at a time. It's the state J.B. Priestley called magic or delight. That's level six. And then I thought, there's just one more level that I can distinguish, the seventh level of consciousness. And the seventh level is what I have called in the occult faculty X. These are the moments in which we experience such enormous intensity that time and space literally disappear. The best known example being Arnold Toynbee climbing Mistra to the ruined citadel. And then as he sat there looking at a particular wall where a hundred years ago the barbarians had broken into Mistra and turned it into the ruin that it was as he looked at it, it suddenly hit him with such force that over that wall there, the barbarians had come precisely a hundred years ago, that it was as if he could see them pouring over. Time and space disappeared. And you go into faculty X. This is obviously what Proust experienced when he tasted the biscuit dipped in tea. Faculty X. Spring morning consciousness raised to such an intensity that quite suddenly you were, as it were, on a higher level completely. Faculty X is obviously the highest normal level of human consciousness. But what really fascinated me was that just before I'd come to America last year, I happened to pick up from the side of my bed <coughs> Uspensky's book, A New Model of the Universe. And I started to read in it the chapter called Experimental Mysticism. Now, I'd read it before because I'd marked it in pencil, and yet I'd totally forgotten it. And as I reread this, I thought, my God, this is one of the most important things I've ever read. Uspensky says that he found some way of inducing mystical experiences. He doesn't tell what it was, but his biographer James Webb suspects it was a mixture of dental gas, nitrous oxide, <laughs> and some yogic exercises or whatever. Whatever method he discovered, he said he, can do it, he could do it again and again, and that as soon as he began to induce the experience, he says the first thing that happened was that he immediately went into a wider state of consciousness so that our normal human consciousness was seen to be an awfully poor half measure. That, you know, it's pitiful to call it consciousness when it's like an incredibly dim candle and that quite suddenly the sun blazes out as soon as you go into the eighth level, the mystical level. He then went on to say that the first thing that hit him about this mystical level was that all our attempts to express it, all the attempts of all the mystics, have been totally inadequate. It's just nothing like it. And he said the trouble with it is you can't say anything about it because in order to say anything, you would have to say everything. Everything appears to be connected. And it's that feeling that you get in moods of tremendous happiness and excitement where you can see that the whole world is connected together, that everything you look at, all your feelings, everything else, are somehow connected in some superb giant web. And then he went on to make another number of other strange observations. He said that suddenly time appeared to have slowed down, not because it had really slowed down, but because ideas were flooding into his brain with such a tremendous intensity that everything he thought of reminded him of something else. Now that made me think of William James who also said that he had mystical experiences, and that they all came in a flash and went almost instantly, but they were always of immense power. And he says that the third of them, for example, happened between two words of a conversation. He said something that his interlocutor said reminded him of something else, and that 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 reminded him, and he said it was like a flash of lightning zigzagging out to some far horizons so that words just could not keep up with the process. Intuition was like lightning 
he said, and quite suddenly this overwhelming feeling of sheer happiness and these immense horizons of fact. Not of some visionary mystical intensity, but ordinary fact. The same fact we can see and touch with our fingers. That's the interesting thing about mystical experience. It's not mystical. It's factual. But it's fact seen on such a wide level that it's like looking at the Grand Canyon. And James said that this had hit him with such force that although he was no longer able to conjure it up, he was still absolutely certain that what he'd seen was objectively real, not just some subjective state. And Uspensky goes on to describe other levels of this mystical experience. For example, he says he went up through a realm of intensity that... Um, oh, my God, am I talking so long? I'll give, I'll give it ten more minutes. But I, I mean, I'll go on till midnight unless you stop me. I just love rambling on. He says that he passed up through a realm which he called a realm of that he could only describe as a realm of mathematical relations. And he said, above the realm of mathematical relations, there were sort of other peculiar realms that, you know, he makes some vague attempt to describe, and finally, a kind of vision of God, which he said he saw as an immense unity embracing everything in the universe. And the odd thing was that it appeared to be turning itself continually inside out, like some enormous flower whose center expanded towards the outside and then somehow went back in again without going back in, as it were, that way, and kept turning itself inside out continually. And then he said, after this vision, he began to come down. Now, several other mystics have described the same thing. A man called R.H. Ward, writing quite recently in England, wrote about his experience under dental gas, and he said, within the first few inhalations of the gas, I had already gone into a state of consciousness far more complete than any degree of ordinary consciousness. And he then goes on to say the next thing that happened was that he appeared to be passing up through what he calls a realm of forms. He said and it was amazing to be sitting in a dentist's chair, suddenly aware that he was proving the reality of Plato's world of forms or ideas. Now this is obviously what um, Uspensky meant by this world of mathematical relations. And he then describes exactly the same stage as, as Uspensky. And he then goes on to say, after this vision of God, in which he could suddenly see that everything is connected, everything is meaningful, they incidentally all talk about that connectedness as being the basic characteristic of the experience, and the immense sense of emotional excitement that always takes place. He said then he found himself descended into what we laughingly call consciousness, and felt himself coming back into this sort of dreary everyday world. And he then says... That, and Uspensky also says, that the sheer boredom of going back to reality overwhelmed him. Uspensky said it was like coming into a kind of wooden world with grinding, slow, wooden wheels. <laughs> he said it was like coming onto a planet whose gravity is so enormous that you can't get up off all fours. And both of them said, you know, what a letdown it was. Now that fascinated me because... I've never had actual mystical experiences, but I've had enough peak experiences and flashes of faculty X to know that they leave me curiously optimistic, curiously glad to be back in the ordinary solid world because I can now handle it. I found myself thinking, if indeed the mystics are correct, and the fact that R.H. Ward and Uspensky appear to be saying precisely the same thing, and that so many mystics have said precisely the same thing, then level eight is indeed an objective reality in which we rise up out of our ordinary human consciousness into a kind of higher realm. In some way, matter is the realm in which we live, and whatever we really are, you know, call it spirit, whatever you like, has descended from some higher realm into matter. And as soon as it descends into matter, it is subject to the laws of matter, which are the laws of levels 1 up to 7. As soon as you get out of level 7, you're in this curious mystical realm in which all of the laws of matter are reversed. And they say, for example, you know, the inside becomes the outside, the subjective becomes the objective, 
you know, time ceases to exist, you are suddenly God, and yet at the same time the smallest grain of sand in the universe, they all sound so absurd, so paradoxical, so inside out. And yet all the mystics say it. I found myself asking, if this is true, if these realms of intensity of mystical experience really exist and are, so to speak, our natural home, that, by the way, is again something the mystics say again and again, it was like going home. It was like rediscovering something you already know perfectly well and what's more, have experienced again and again and as often as not forgotten instantaneously. If these realms are our natural home, then what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> And that seemed to me to be, in a way, the most interesting question of all. Rolf Steiner once said, never complain about your lot in life because you chose it before you were born. If we chose to be here, why did we choose it? That struck me as the really interesting question. And I began to feel that, in a sense, the answer is obvious. Whenever I was a child and I was really intensely happy, I got bored with happiness. I, at a certain point, would feel, okay, <laughs> that's nice. Now let's get back to reality. Just like William James in the Ch Ch Chautauqua community. Happiness is boring in large quantities because somehow we have a feeling that our business is not with happiness but with molding reality. And that seems to me to be the really important point. You see, the trouble with these higher levels, level 8 and so on, is like trying to sculpt in smoke. You couldn't do it. Here we are in an extremely solid universe. I remember when I was in my teens going along to a meeting of the Theosophical Society, most of which sounded nonsense to me until they remarked that Madame Blavatsky said that our Earth is the lowest level of the universe. We are kind of in the outer Siberia of the universe. But... It's also the best level in a way because our chances of doing something are so much higher here. Anything we do remains solid and done permanently. It doesn't dissolve away. It's not like writing on sand and having it washed off by the sea. We're in such a solid universe that anything we do sticks. And that's the interesting thing. Whenever you get into these moods of intensity, when you suddenly realize that, you know, life is good, you realize also that you have this feeling that you can do such important things now you know. That feeling that now you know, if only you could take advantage of this vision, you could build the most extraordinary structures, so to speak, and they'd be done permanently. You see, at the beginning of the century, there was this extremely unfashionable view um, in biology called vitalism advocated mainly by a man called Hans Driesch, by Bernard Shaw and by Henri Bergson, the French philosopher. What all of them said was very similar. They said, life exists on a level above the universe, above our material universe, and is trying to invade it. And T. E. Hume, of whom I wrote extensively in The Outsider, paraphrased this by saying, it's as if the amoeba is a tiny little leak of life forcing its way through this kind of dam into the universe, excuse me, into the universe, that you could think of um, fishes and animals and horses and so on as bigger and bigger leaks. And then, as human beings, as the biggest leak so far, a great sort of gush of vitality flooding into this material universe. And yet, even so, the real problem of vitality, of life, of conquering the material universe is that, you know, it keeps getting absorbed and almost feels that it's back to square one. And yet, obviously, you've only got to look at our position now to see how far we've come. You know, not just from the amoeba, but even from human beings of three centuries ago. If Voltaire, who was incredibly intelligent, was now in this room with us, he wouldn't understand a word that I'm talking about. It would all be completely beyond him. We have pushed language out and out and out into those realms of the unknown until we can actually begin to conquer them. 
the Romantics thought, you know, that these moods of ecstasy and so on were completely ineffable and there was nothing you could do about it. And that, you know, the ordinary material universe would sooner or later crush you because death was the ultimate reality. We can see that, in fact, the peak experience is an objective experience and that there is no reason at all why, once you grasp this logically, you shouldn't continue to have the peak experience, not by any tremendous effort of will, but, as I say, by suddenly recognizing that you were already there. Maslow's students began having peak experiences as soon as they began to talk to one another about peak experiences. It's like turning your face in that direction, and there is the peak experience. It's already there. It's a perception, not an emotion or a feeling. Now, I, in a book called Mysteries, put it this way. If you were in a business, a point would come, you know, where suddenly the business would begin to show a profit if you're lucky. And we call that, you know, the, the turnaround point. Up until then, you're putting back all your profit into the business, plowing it back in, and not getting very much out. And then quite suddenly, because you've put enough in, you reach a kind of critical mass, and suddenly the business begins to go perfectly. And quite suddenly, you know, you can start absorbing other businesses, and you're past this critical point. And that critical point, which I called the feedback point, in the same way, in human existence, there is a feedback point. And the feedback point, as Nietzsche said, is these curious moments when suddenly we begin to feel that everything is going well, that obstacles are disappearing, that we are triumphing. And you notice that talking earlier about the levels of consciousness, that the level at which that begins to happen is around about three and a half, which is precisely a half of seven. I'm not saying that's of any great significance, but it seems to me, you know, an interesting point. Get beyond the ordinary level of three and a half and know, intellectually, that the lower levels are, in fact, lower levels and not some ultimate truth, as the Romantics thought they were. Know, intellectually, that you're actually going up. And, you know, it's like using an ordinary map, a street map, to get somewhere. And quite suddenly, you know, you were going in the right direction, you were beyond level three and a half, you passed the feedback point, and in a certain sense now, provided you know it, and don't let yourself, as it were, be overwhelmed by negative emotions, there is no way of getting you to go back. You've passed the feedback point. You see, I sometimes express it in another way. Um, <clears throat> and this I put into the last chapter of my book on Wilhelm Reich. In ordinary states of consciousness, or rather, as I say, what we jokingly call normal consciousness, it's as if your mind is scattered like a lot of billiard balls all over a tabletop. When you get interested in something and focus, it's as if the billiard balls all began to come together into the centre of the tabletop. If you get really interested, they press into such a tight cluster that they begin to climb up on top of one another. And you begin to get a kind of second row forming, and that's about as far as most of us can go. We do that under conditions of, you know, real crisis, real emergency, real excitement. And then, you know, we just let go and they go, Ugh, all back over the tabletop again into so-called normal consciousness. But... When you begin to experience that sense of the billiard balls climbing into a second row, you suddenly know that if you could continue to make the effort, they'd cluster together so tightly they'd go into a third row, and then a fourth, and then a fifth, and that eventually you'd have a kind of pyramid of billiard balls. And that what's more, once you got the pyramid, it would never dissolve, because you would be in such a, an intense state of certainty that it would be stupid to let them dissolve any more than a child falls asleep in the middle of his own Christmas party. You pass the feedback point. And as soon as you pass the feedback point, you are only capable, so to speak, of going forward. You can see the sheer stupidity of going backwards. That feedback point is round about sort of level two on the pyramid. 
It's also, as I say, in the um, levels of consciousness, around about level three and a half. Now, what I'm saying is, most of us now in this room, around about level three and a half, or with a bit of luck, you know, <laughs> getting on towards the top, towards level four. So, we're already more than halfway there. We are in a unique position in the history of evolution. We've actually reached this feedback point where an extra conscious effort, and what's more, just conscious knowledge, intellectual knowledge, the kind of thing that I'm now trying to convey in words, is enough to keep you going forward and beyond the top of level four and into level five. I can envisage a time when human beings perfectly normally pump up their pressure so high as soon as they wake up in the morning that everything appears good, that they would be virtually unconquerable. And of course, the first thing that would happen, as Bernard Shaw says, is that we, we would begin to live quite normally beyond the age of 100, you know, maybe up to the age of 300. Human beings would be totally transformed. And this seems to me to be the most important vision of all, the recognition of how close we are to it, even I recognize it on something like this trip to America. You know, I've been driving myself like mad, and the first thing that happened when I landed was that I got a filthy cold. I woke up in the middle of the night and thought, oh Christ, that's all I need on a lecture tour, a real cold with no voice. And I deliberately, as it were, began to call upon deeper forces inside myself. Now, I realized a long time ago that these deeper forces exist, and that if I make the real mental effort, I can actually get them to the surface. I talk in one of my essays about what I call the Laurel and Hardy theory of consciousness. <clears throat> we have two people inside our heads, one living in the right side of the brain and one living in the left. And they're like two completely different individuals. <clears throat> you know that in split brain patients, you, they turn into two people. You know, sometimes they split the brain down the middle to cure epilepsy. And Gazzaniger and Sperry recognize that when this happens, they have suddenly two people. One split-brain patient was trying to hit his wife with one hand and trying to um, hold it back with the other. Another split-brain patient was trying to unzip his fly with one hand and do it up with the other, and so on. Two people. Um, if you show a split-brain patient an apple with his left eye, which is connected to the right side of the brain, and an orange with his right eye, which is connected to the left side of the brain, and you say, what have you just seen? He replies, an orange. If you say, right with your left hand, what you've just seen, he writes apple. If you say, what have you just written? He replied, orange. If you show him a dirty picture with the right side of the brain, he blushes. If you say, why are you blushing? He says, I don't know. Because he who lives in the left half of the brain, the you, has not seen it. It's that other person over there who's doing the blushing. Now, that other person over there is what I call Stan. And the person who lives in your left brain, the ordinary you, is Ollie. And the person who first realized this was not Sperry or Gazzaniga, but an American psychologist of the 1880s called Thompson J. Hudson, who was actually a newspaper editor. He saw a man under hypnosis doing the most extraordinary things, producing, for example, brilliant intellectual um, improvisations of which he would have been capable, incapable in his ordinary conscious state. And he was baffled by the brilliance and thought, what is happening is that the hypnotist is putting the him, so to speak, to sleep, and some far more powerful and brilliant person inside his head can take over. And the same goes, you see, with um, ordinary physical things. You know, he was fascinated by a hypnotist who could make a person go as stiff as a board, and then say, you know, two people will jump up and down in your stomach and you won't bend in the middle. And he wouldn't. Obviously, he said, the hypnotist has put the ordinary you to sleep and this other far more powerful person is then able to make you go stiff as a board and do these incredible things. <coughs> now, that other person, as I say, I have called Stan. The ordinary you is Ollie. And when you wake up in the morning, it's Ollie who opens his eyes on the world. It's Ollie who says, you know, what am I doing in this meaningless world and so on. On the other hand, when you are in these strange moods of happiness, it is Stan, the right brain, who is the intuitive one. He's the artist, Ollie's the scientist, who sends you up gushes of energy and happiness. In fact, the peak experience. It's Stan who is capable of transforming your life 
But unfortunately, we don't know he's there. We're totally unaware of his existence for 99% of the time. Until we get into these curious states of happiness and certainty, these glowing states in which the whole world is visibly good, the state in which Van Gogh painted the starry night, when suddenly, as it were, you can't actually see Stan, but you can feel him, and you're aware of his support because the energy is gushing up from him and producing the peak experience. That is why Maslow's students began having peak experiences all the time. They were suddenly aware of their Stan. And they were saying, as it were, in these relaxed moods, OK, energy please, and Stan was obediently shooting up energy. In other words, it is simply a question of recognizing the existence of this immensely powerful partner in the other half of the brain. Unfortunately, of course, Stan, besides being immensely powerful, is also so intuitive that when we, Ollie, gets discouraged, he gets ten times as discouraged and doesn't send us up any energy, which is why we're getting to low states, depressed states. But as soon as you're aware of his existence, he will always send you up energy. You know those games you played as a child when you stood as stiff as a board and you kind of fell back into the arms of a friend who was waiting behind you to catch you, but you never really dared to because you were afraid he'd stand back and let you fall flat on your back. Well, Stan is like that, only Stan will never let you fall flat on your back. He will always catch you. I d d described the other day how when I was writing about this in my book on Wilhelm Reich, I'd suddenly realized exactly how I could use this. I'd had to go to London to write, rewrite a film script for Dino De Laurentiis, and it was really a lousy script, which I loathed. And he locks me in a hotel room and pushes food under the door and keeps me locked in for 10 days until I've written the script. And on this occasion... I thought, oh my God, you know, this time I've bitten off more than I can chew. It was, it was really rotten even for Dino, who's probably the worst film producer in the business. <laughs> and I read this awful film and thought, you know, no, nothing I can do. And as I felt this sinking despair, I suddenly thought, you know, nope, I feel, you know, if I'm right and Stanny's over there, let's see what he can do. So I said, as I was falling asleep, you know, come on, give me a hand, help me, will you? And then I went into a lovely deep sleep with a kind of feeling of total trust as if I'd been a child saying my prayers. The next morning I woke up and I approached the script and, you know, I reread it and I began to see little things that could in fact be changed. And suddenly the whole thing was going beautifully, except that on the tenth day I was sure that I'd still got so much to do I just would not finish it on time. But I started at seven in the morning Everything went perfectly, things fell neatly into place, and at five o'clock that afternoon I finished the last word of the script exactly as Dino's secretary banged on the door to come and collect it and translate it into Italian. And I suddenly had this feeling that the very fact she'd knocked on the door as I typed the last words, these synchronicities always happen when you're in good form. And I said, you know, well, can I go home now? <laughs> and... Um, the Dino said, OK, and sent a car for me to take me to the station. As I went to the station, you know, I sort of said, oh, thank you, right brain, you know, with a certainty that this is what had done it. I've discovered ever since then that, in fact, you know, provided you approach things in the right way, provided you recognize that you've got this partner there whose business is to send you up energy, so that tiredness is, in a sense, a delusion. It's a kind of false fatigue. There's always more. And as soon as you recognize this, you also, of course, recognize that Stan is the author of all so-called paranormal experience. If, for example, um, you can douse for water, you realize the rod is twisting like mad in your hands and you appear to know nothing about it. It's just like holding a voltmeter and watching the needle swing over. And yet something in you is doing it. The something in you is Stan. He appears to have basically supernatural powers. And as I say, as soon as you begin to realize this, you realize that here's the source of the peak experience, and that we appear to have this enormous energy which we can use whenever we want to. Now, it is actually literally knowing this, and knowing it not merely in this kind of semi-religious sense of, you know, okay, so I've got something inside me that will send me up energy, so, you know, so sounding like Dale Carnegie or Norman Vincent Peale or something, but the intellectual knowledge 
that this is a purely logical process. And that once all human beings recognize this, we shall have passed beyond this feedback point and there will be no going back. The human race will be completely transformed. I've been thinking about this for 32 years, 34 years in fact, since I began to write The Outsider. When I started thinking about it in The Outsider, I had a strong intuition it was true. And there are times when I felt, you know, that maybe I was mistaken. But now, 34 years later, I'm absolutely convinced that it's true. I have just no doubt whatsoever. Anyway, I better stop now and um, let you ask questions or whatever. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. I was last year, but um, I'm going back home in a few days. Okay, I'll have a, I have a friend that's going to be very disappointed. Um, would you speak one moment on the education of young children? Your ideas about education. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, one thing is fairly obvious. If what I'm saying is correct, and we have this person in the other side of the brain who can be stimulated by optimism, then the ideal people, in a way, <laughs> to indoctrinate with us are young children because they find it so easy to go into these moods of total optimism. As I say, Christmas time, for example, you can see this operating. What happens at Christmas is, you know, Ollie wakes up in the morning and says, Marvelous, it's Christmas. And Stan overhears this and says, Marvelous, it's Christmas, because he, he always exaggerates. And then everything reinforces this feeling of happiness, the lights on the Christmas tree, the smell of cooking, the Christmas carols, um, each time Stan sends up a spurt of energy, and so most children experience these states that Wordsworth describes, you know, when meadow, grove, and stream, and everything is apparelled in celestial light. And this is simply because his Stan and Ollie, Ollie are so active. When we get older, when, as Wordsworth said, shades of the prison house begin to close, we've slipped out of this state of recognising that Stan is a reality. And so it seems to me... You see, my, my children, for example, are fairly bright. And ever since they've been quite fairly young, I've been teaching them this kind of thing. And, you know, reading them books before they go to school, starting off when they were babies with The Lord of the Rings and now getting on to things like The Magic Mountain. And realising, to my astonishment, how easy it is, if you simply make the assumption that they can do this, they themselves begin to do it automatically. So that seems to me to be the real question about educating children, to educate them in the right things to produce a kind of peculiar self-confidence. That's all that matters, producing that peculiar self-confidence that comes from knowing what you know I've been trying to explain. Uh, yeah, point I want to make, and I agree with you that we are at probably three and a half. But the one thing that I see is that it's not the children. I begin to see that where we need to start is with the sperm and the ova. I begin to see we need to start a conception and in pregnancy. It's an extremely important place that I have learned in my work that if we influence the mother and the father, we are the potential of a child that will understand more what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, that's what I see. That does figure indeed. Um, when um, I wrote The Outsider, your American writer Howard Fast um, sent me a fascinating story he'd written called um, The First Men. His story was about a man who is studying feral children, you know, children who've been brought up by wolves and, or other animals, and notices that feral children remain wolves or gorillas or whatever they've been brought up with, even when they've been brought back into human society. Because once they've been con conditioned at an early stage um, to believing themselves to be a wolf or whatever, they remain wolves and there's no way of increasing their intelligence. Now what Fast postulates is that among human beings there are bound to be many born who he calls man plus and brought up among the rest of us wolves and apes, then nevertheless so conditioned that there's no possibility of getting them to any higher level. Now what Fast says in his story is that it ought to be possible to 
intelligence test children while they're still in the womb or still such small babies that you could tell man plus. And if you could do that and if you could take them away as it were and put them in a restricted society where they were with highly intelligent human beings who treated them like man plus and with others of their own kind, you would actually create a super race. Now this, you know, was Fast's idea in the story, but it seems to me to be obviously true. If somehow we could grasp the intelligence, the potential intelligence of babies while they're still in the womb, there's nothing that could not be done. Our problem at the moment, you know, is that we're stuck in this paradigm that we ourselves have created. The interesting thing about Maslow is that he was the first one to start smashing it. And it seems to me that once you've started smashing that, anything can happen. Um. Well, with regard to the soul, if, uh, if there's anybody here that's convinced of reincarnation, the soul, if the soul doesn't occupy the body till birth, then the soul is going to have a lot to do with the individual's inclinations in life, and, and perhaps a lot of uh, its uh, talents, so that if you start playing with sperm and ovum, uh, you, you're still going to, the choices are still going to be for the soul, which body, what vehicle it chooses to be born in. And uh, these inclinations about, uh, well, like super people, then it'll be those souls that have inclinations to be super people that will choose bodies that are going to facilitate uh, their inclinations. Um, yes, oddly enough, that's not quite true. Now, I agree with you. Um, I, when I started writing about the paranormal, reincarnation was the last thing I was interested in. But having sort of started to get interested in various cases, um, Ian Stevenson had done this book, um, I forget, 12 cases or something, suggestive of reincarnation. And these are examined with such scientific precision that I began to be convinced. Now, one of his m most amazing cases um, was of a boy with a name like um, Lal Jat. This happened in India. I've, I've got the case here in my latest book. Anyway, um, the point about it was that this child was on the point of death and then apparently died of smallpox. Before they buried him the next morning, he began to stir again and um, revived. But the family were greatly puzzled that he seemed to have totally changed his personality from the moment he died to the moment he woke up. As soon as um, he began to recover and began to talk, he declared that, you know, he was not the previous child, but was somebody who died in a village about 50 miles away. Um, he, wouldn't, he declared also he was a higher caste than his parents and wouldn't eat their food. <laughs> anyway, eventually, um, this case was investigated by Stevenson and had already been investigated by the family themselves. They checked... A, no, what happened first was that a woman from this distant village came walking down the street and the boy declared that he recognised her as his aunt. They then began to sort of look at this distant village. They de decided, they de discovered that indeed someone had died who corresponded exactly to the description of the boy, as he said he was. He said he died from a fall from a cart. The interesting thing was this. The person who had died from the fall from the cart had died shortly, a couple of hours after the death of their son and while the body was still lying there. And it looked as if what had happened is that, is that he'd literally taken over their son's body and proceeded to use it as his own. Now, another interesting point struck me. In the study of multiple personality, you discover that the personalities who take over the body in one of these multiples not only appear to have completely different personalities, they also have different brain patterns if you put an EEG machine on their head. Now, that's as absurd as the same person having several lots of fingerprints. It's almost impossible. And not only that, they have different immune systems. So that one of the persons in the body, let's say, um, in the case of a girl, uh, has an allergy to silk stockings and comes out in pimples if she puts them on. Another character in the body has no such allergy and can wear silk stockings. In one particular case, um, one person could be put under uh, to sleep fairly easy with anaesthetic. Another one was quite immune to it and would come awake. And so when the person was under anaesthetic and the other person took over, she'd suddenly wake up. Now, this is being documented more and more carefully. And it begins to look as if it is the person in the body who chooses the body's powers and capacities. <laughs>
and not, you know, the body itself, as you would imagine. Once again, this extraordinary suggestion that in some strange way the power of the will, or as you would say of the soul, over the body, is infinitely greater than we imagine. I think central casting uh, put out a call and said, I have a body here, and this, this child is already retired, and we have a body here. It's kind of like, like we need yeah. somebody to run this show. <laughs> I agree. And when I wrote The Occult, I was thought that was a lot of nonsense, and yet the more... I've looked into this quite objectively. I, I assure you, I'm not basically interested in all this. It doesn't in any way sort of excite me, but it does seem to me to be nevertheless objectively true, and I have to confess I believe it is. And there's a lady here. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the um, prospect of the transformation that you're talking about. Um, once people can learn to use peak experiences with will, and what I'm wondering is what will replace or will that the tension or chaos that we seem to require to live? You know, once things, like you were saying, once things start to get good, we all of a sudden will bonk ourselves on the head or we'll go to war or something to make life more interesting or horrible and then we'll work ourselves back up to a good state. But in when the transformation takes place or if you can imagine it taking place, what will replace that system that we seem so to thrive on. No, I think you've mistaken, basically, what I'm saying. Um, what you're asking about, you know, the business of our needing chaos in order to clamber to higher levels does not apply in the peak experience. It's similar to a question I always get asked. If we had peak experiences continually, wouldn't they turn into plateau experiences and become boring? The point is that the peak experience is essentially an experience of freedom, and by definition, freedom cannot be boring. Freedom is that moment in which you rise above your robot and feel this curious you know, self-control, this control over your own destiny. By definition, this cannot be boring. And by definition, in that state, you wouldn't want to go to war merely to liven things up. You're already, as it were, in a state of freedom. Our problem is, it's when we are in the robotic mechanical states that we look around deliberately for difficult challenges um, to drive us into a higher state. What I'm saying is that I can conceive if enough people could begin to grasp this kind of thing, and I believe also with Rupert Sheldrake that it's not merely a ma matter of passing this on intellectually, that as soon as we get a kind of critical mass of human beings who can do it, it will spread by what Sheldrake calls morphic resonance, the hundredth monkey business. And I also, but, you know, you, you remember, you know, the monkeys on Kojima Island who began washing their sweet potatoes in the sea, and then the monkeys on other islands apparently um, began doing this, although they had no contacts with the original ones. And this wasn't telepathy, because Sheldrake says it happens with crystals too, that um, you... Um, have a crystal that's extremely difficult to crystallize in some laboratory in the world, but as soon as you've got it crystallized in any laboratory, it begins to crystallize in all the other laboratories much more easily. And he thinks that it's a process more like electrical induction, or, you know, radio, um, than ordinary chemistry. Now, I think this is so about what we are talking about, that this is going to pass from one to another by this process that Sheldrake calls morphic resonance. Um, I also feel that once we've passed beyond this critical mass, and this is what I started to say, we are going to get a different type of human being who somehow is just no longer tangled in his own negative emotions to the extent that most of us are. Now, what I was saying, you see, about the peak experience is that Maslow's young mother was already, in a sense, in the peak experience, or really she had all the reasons to be in it, when she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky, and went into it. Now, what I'm trying to say is that most of us are in this same position. It's not a matter of somehow, you know, intensifying our lives by war or whatever else. It is simply a matter of turning your face in that direction and getting the recognition. Now, I've been uh, here in, um, I was staying in Los Angeles with some people who were in this group of Dafrijon. And I've been hearing a lot about this Dafrijon, you see, as a prophet and all the rest of it. It seems to me that although, you know, there are many things about him that deeply put me off, one thing that is quite clear is that he has also, as it were, um, grasped this recognition and can actually somehow make his disciples see it. <laughs>
so that they go into the peak experience spontaneously. A woman I know in London has just written a book to which I've written an introduction about her apprenticeship to Uspensky and various other people, but also to the Maharishi. She said that when the Maharishi first came to London, she went along to see him. He merely put his finger on her forehead, and instantly she went into a state of total ecstasy, went and sat down in the corner of the room and proceeded to meditate, and was so completely relaxed and happy that she suddenly noticed the traffic was getting heavier outside the windows, and that she'd been relaxed there for five hours, and it was time to go home and get her husband's dinner. And obviously, the Maharishi could do this too. Also, she said, on one occasion when she was, the Maharishi was in an Oxford hotel, and there were crowds of disciples in the corridor all waiting to be initiated, an old lady at the end of the corridor sent a message saying they were all being far too noisy, and the management said to the Maharishi, would he mind moving up to the next floor? And the Maharishi said, no, he wouldn't. But he said to the Joyce, who had brought in the message, don't worry, we shan't hear from her anymore. And indeed, the old lady did not complain anymore. Obviously, this peculiar power is a version of Sheldrake's morphic resonance. It's not, I think, telepathy. And he could do it spontaneously. <clears throat> now, as soon as, I think, enough human beings begin to do this, it's going to spread across the whole human race, and we're going to get a far more rational type of human being. As soon as we are rational, we become peakers. A peak is not an emotion, it is a perception. And as soon as we are rational, we see it. And as soon as we see it, we become peakers. What do you think about the use of the tarot and I Ching as uh, tools for developing this? I don't know about um, the um, I Ching as a tool for developing this. All I know is that like um, Jung, I've always found that it works oddly simply because when you place yourself in these states of great inner pressure, good synchronicities immediately begin to happen, just as bad things began to, began to happen to me in America once I let my inner pressure out. Um, what appears to happen is that in some strange way, as the mystics say the inner becomes the outer and the outer becomes the inner, this happens in these moods of intensity. You know, <clears throat> that um, alchemical formula of Hermes Trismegistos, as above, so below, which is usually meant, um, to, uh, understood to mean that, you know, the microcosm, the bigger universe, uh, the smaller universe of man is the same as the macrocosm, the bigger universe. But it seems to me there's another far more interesting sense of as above, so below, and that is this. You know um, what a transformer is, I'm an electrical transformer. If, for example, um, I take my uh, English electric razor here to America, your American electricity is only 120 volts compared to twice that in England. I have to buy a thing called a step-down transformer so that I can actually use my English razor on your American electricity. In the same way, though, if I took an American razor back to England, I could use the same transformer to step up the electricity, in, uh, step down the electricity in England, rather, to... 120 volts. Now, a transformer is an odd thing. It consists of a magnet with wire wrapped around it in a coil. And outside that coil, there's another coil with twice as many winds in it as the inner one. Now, if you connect your electricity to the inner one, the magnetic field somehow communicates itself to the outer one, and suddenly you've got a current twice as big going through the outer one. And that's how it steps up. On the other hand, if you want to step it down, you connect up the electricity to the outer one, the magnetic induction goes through to the inner one, and you've got half the current coming out. Now, we know that the external world can influence us. We know this all the time. It's always, as it were, you know, depressing us, or the sun comes out and cheers us up. We're used to this state, this way around, and I believe that when we are in that state, it is like using your transformer as a step-down transformer from the higher current to the lower. When we get into these moods of intensity and happiness, we accidentally connect up the transformer the other way around, and it becomes a step-up transformer, and suddenly you are influencing the external world in some strange way causing weird synchronicities. The first thing you discover when you get into these states is that, you know, you start hearing names over and over again. 
that you've never heard before. And there are all of these other, you know, strange apparent coincidences. They always show you that you are in good spiritual health. 